Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Family Life Christian Center as we continue with our, our Bible study series of the book of Revelations. Today we'll be going over chapter 15. So we welcome you, all, all those of you that are here live and in person, and uh, those of you that are joining us online. If you're joining us online and you'd like to follow through with some notes, I urge you to go to our website, familylifespring.org, and go to the media tab, click on the book of Revelations, and then from there you can click down to the week that we're on, which is we're going to be covering chapter 15 today. You can click on that link, and then you can print out your own worksheet and follow along with us as we go through uh, chapter 15 today. And if you've missed any of the previous lessons, you can always go back and click on that link for that week and uh, pull up the notes for that as well. And you can also have a link for, uh, uh, for the video so you can uh, study at your own pace. So we, uh, we encourage you to do so. So we thank you for joining us. Uh, today is Super Bowl Sunday. Everybody ready? <laughs> Everybody's ready. All right. So I think the Reddish team is going to win. What do y'all think? <laughs> So, um, so today we're also having a, a wonderful thing for our youth. We're having a, a, a Super Bowl or chili cook-off uh, to benefit the youth. So we're going to have a lot of uh, tasty vittles uh, coming up today after service. So if you're just waking up and hearing my voice, you've got time to make it here. So uh, you can come in and do some taste testing of your own. So uh, uh, before we continue, let's just go ahead and bow our head in prayer. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for who you are and for what you do, Lord, for us. You, you are all in all, Lord. Um, we can do nothing without you, Lord. And we just ask that you just give us peace as we, uh, as we study the book of Revelations, Lord. We know sometimes it can be hard to understand, but Lord, we ask that you give us understanding. Open our ears to hear, Lord. Open our eyes to see uh, what the Spirit is, uh, is telling us as we go through and read your word, Lord. And we just ask also that you speak to us uh, through it, Lord. And help us to understand what you're telling us. We thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity, Lord. We just ask that for your anointing over this time of teaching. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, all right. So uh, I hope you all been able to follow along okay in the book of Revelations. Uh, I know it's a lot. Last week was a lot. It was a, it was a little over an hour, I believe, of, uh, of notes, of lectures. So uh, just to, to recap last week, last week was... Uh, a series of proleptic statements uh, that, that God is wanting us to understand. Uh, in proleptic, uh, th- what that means is a, a future event that uh, whenever he talks about it, he talks about it as if it's already happened, but it is a future event. Um, and what he's telling us is Babylon has fallen. So Babylon is going to fall, and he wants us to understand that because he wants, to, he wants us to be encouraged because there's a lot of bad things that are, that, that's happening in chapter 14. Uh, a, a lot of... Uh, uh, death and destruction, to, just to put it mildly. And uh, so he's wanting to encourage the saints. Now, mind you, the, uh, the Christians have already been raptured. So this is for the Christians that weren't saved uh, prior to the rapture, but be, got saved after the rapture. So he's trying to encourage them just to hold on a little bit longer. Don't give in. Don't take the mark of the beast. You know, just hold on for a little while longer and then, because in the end, it's going to be all right. It's going to be good. But I know there's going to be some suffering uh, until that time comes. So, uh, so John's just giving us that word of encouragement through these uh, angelic beings that are, that are, you know, giving us these statements, these proleptic statements, telling us that Babylon has fallen. Um, you know, don't give in. It's just going to be a little while longer. Endure to the end because it's going to be good and it's going to be worth it. So, uh, so that's the encouragement. And that's kind of where we left off. Uh, last week with chapter 15. Now, this week, we continue on to chapter 15. Now, today's going to be a short lesson, so (laughs) I hear cheers in the background. No. (laughs) Because uh, this is only eight verses. So, with eight verses, it's it's pretty good. It's not going to be that long of of a class. So, maybe give us some more opportunities to do some taste testing out there with the soups and the chilies. (laughs) So, so if you don't mind, turn with me to chapter 15. Now, what I want to do is I want to read all eight verses. Since it's not that much, we'll go ahead and read it. And then we'll go verse by verse and break it down. So, uh, Revelations 15, verses 1 through 8. It says, I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign, seven angels with the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. 
And I saw what looked like a sea of glass glowing with fire and standing beside the sea, those who had been victorious over the beast and its image and over the number of its name. They held harps given by them by God and sang the song of God's servants, Moses and of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. After this, I looked, and I saw in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen, and wore golden sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now, as you can see, chapter 15 introduces the final series of judgments that are going to come upon the earth. Now, the NIV refers to them as seven bowls of God's wrath. And if you have the King James Version, it refers to them as vials. But either way, it means the very same thing. So God's wrath is getting ready to be poured out upon the earth, which we're going to see in chapter 16. And the end result is going to be that the fall of Babylon, which is going to be in chapter 17 and 18, and then finally the return of Jesus Christ in chapter 19. So as you can see, we're getting very close to the end of the book of Revelations. And what, uh, what this is all coming to, this great climax. So, uh, so today we're going to study chapter 15, and we're going to go uh, verse by verse. So let's go ahead and break it down with verse number 1. I saw in heaven another great and marvelous sign. Seven angels with the seven plagues, uh, the seven last plagues, last because with them God's wrath is completed. Now God's wrath is going to be poured out upon the earth in the form of plagues. Now, I want you to underline the word plagues. The word plague is translated from the Greek word plague. In fact, our English word plague is transliterated from this word, and it means the very same thing as it does in the Greek. A, uh, a plague refers to a widespread affliction or calamity. So we know the seven different calamities or afflictions are going to come upon the earth. And these seven plagues are the last plagues that will ever come upon the earth with one exception. And what is that one exception? Anyone know? Well, Zechariah chapter 14 tells us that during the millennium, every nation is going to be required to travel to Jerusalem to worship the king of kings. And any nation that doesn't do that won't receive rain. They'll experience a drought, which is considered a plague, a calamity, or an affliction that's going to come upon that nation. So turn, to, uh, turn with me to Zechariah 14. Verses 16 through 19. And notice what it says. It says, in the end, what does it mean in the end? The end of this age, when the end of the world comes. So in the end, the enemies of Jerusalem who survived the plague, and this is talking about the final plague. Now, this isn't the last plague of the seven plagues. This is really referred to when Jesus, Jesus Christ comes and he speaks the word. So you go back to Zechariah chapter 14 and read the verses before verse number 16. And what you're going to find out is that when all these enemies come to the nation of Israel, there's going to be a battle throughout the land. And at that point, when Jesus Christ comes, he's going to speak the word. And what happens is unbelievable. Just go back and read it. But he says in the end, the enemies of Jerusalem who survived the plague, the final plague, they'll go up to Jerusalem each year to worship the king the Lord of Heaven's armies, and to celebrate the Festival of Shelters, otherwise known as the Festival of Booths. And any nation in the world that refuses to come to Jerusalem to worship the King, the Lord of Heaven's armies, and who's the Lord of Heaven's armies? Jesus Christ. Will have no rain. So then he gives them the examples. In verse 18, it says, If the people of Egypt refuse to attend the festival, the Lord will punish them with the same plagues that he sends on other nations who refuse to go. Egypt and other nations will all be punished if they don't go to celebrate the Festival of Shelters or the Festival of Booths. But booths, mm -hmm. uh, but excluding that one exception, these seven plagues are the last plagues 
that will ever come upon the earth. Now, why? Well, verse number one tells us. Look at the last part of verse number one in Revelation chapter 15. It says, seven angels with the seven last plagues last because with them God's wrath is completed. Now, this won't make sense unless you understand what the word completed in the Greek means. Completed is translated from the Greek word teleo. And teleo means to complete or to fulfill in the sense of achieving a specific goal. So here they're achieving a specific goal. If you say something is completed, teleo, what you mean is that that goal has been achieved. If the goal has not been achieved, then whatever you're talking about is not completed. Teleo has not been fulfilled because the goal has not been achieved. Does that make sense? Okay. So what this is saying in verse number one is that these will be the last plagues to ever come upon the earth because through them, the ultimate goal is achieved. Now, what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to usher in the return of Jesus Christ. To usher in the return of Jesus Christ. That's the thing that we're waiting for. In fact, when Jesus had been resurrected, and in those last few days he spent with his disciples, they wanted to know one thing. And that one thing they wanted to know is, when is your kingdom going to be set upon this earth? So he had to go through and explain to them that there's going to be a period of time known as the church age. But after that, after that seven-year period of tribulation, I will come back and set up my kingdom upon the earth. So the ultimate goal is the return of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what happened at the end of these seven plagues. Jesus Christ returns, and he sets up his kingdom here on the earth. And once the kingdom of God is set up, there won't be any more plagues with one exception. As I said, any nation during the millennial kingdom that doesn't travel to Jerusalem every year to worship the king is going to experience drought. Besides that, it will literally be a perfect world when Jesus returns and he sets up his kingdom here upon, the, upon this earth. There will be no more plagues. In fact, let me show you how great it's going to be during the thousand-year rule which Jesus set up, uh, sets up his kingdom here upon the earth. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11, verses 6 through 9. It's so interesting. I've been just happened to be reading in Isaiah in my personal reading time, and there's just so much in Isaiah that reverts back to the Book of Revelations. It's just like the more we look under, or the more I understand the Book of Revelations, the more I see it in other other books of the Bible, and especially in, in Isaiah. So anyway, Isaiah 11, 6 through nine says, "In that day, now what day is he talking about? In the day that the kingdom of God is set upon the, in the world." In other words, when Jesus returns and his kingdom of God is here on the earth. So in that day, the wolf and the lamb will live together. The leopard will lie down with the baby goat. The calf and the yearling will be safe with the lion. And the little child will lead them all. The cow will graze near the bear. The cub and the calf will lie down together. And the lion will eat hay like a cow. Now, if you go back and you study in the book of Genesis before the fall of Adam, what you'll find is that God created the animals to eat plants. They were not intended to eat other animals. But because of Adam's sin, it perverted the entire world. So what we're going to find out is that everything is going to revert back to the way it was before the fall of Adam. So notice what it says. The baby will play safely near the hole of a cobra. Yes, a little child will put his hand in a nest of deadly snakes without harm. Nothing will hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain. As for the waters fill the sea, so the earth will be filled with people who know the Lord. So now my granddaughter can travel to Australia, and she'll be able to actually swim with these great white sharks and not have to worry about anything because it's going to revert back to the way it was before the fall. I have a granddaughter that just loves sharks, the megalodons and all that stuff. <laughs> so it, was literally, it will literally be a perfect world during the millennial kingdom. And it's going to be just like as it was before Adam and Eve ever fell. So Revelations 15, 2 through 4. I saw before me what seemed to be a glass, sea, a glass sea mixed with fire. And on it stood all the people who had been victorious over the beast and his statue and the number representing his name. They're all holding up harps that God had given them. So that, this is where we uh, get that picture of angels flying around playing harps. So it comes from right here in the book of Revelations. 
And they're singing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your works, O Lord God, the Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and glorify your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship before you, for your righteous deeds have been revealed. Now, if you remember, the throne of God sits on what looks like a sea of glass. Remember, all the way back in Revelation chapter 4 and verse number 6, we got a glimpse of what heaven is like. And in that glimpse of what heaven is like, we found out that the throne sits on what looks like to be a sea of glass. Y'all remember that, studying that back then? So turn back to Revelation 4, verse 6. It says, also in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass, clear as crystal. In the center around the throne were four living creatures, and they were covered with eyes in front and back. So what John is seeing here in Revelation 15 are the martyrs from the tribulation singing before the throne of God. Now, we know they're martyrs because it says they were victorious over the beast in his image and over the number of his name. So we know that this group has gone through the last, uh, uh, the last part of the, uh, I'm sorry. So this group has gone through at least part of the last half of the tribulation because they not only had to face the beast according to verse number two and three, but they had to face the pressure to worship the image of the beast and to take the mark of the beast. But they endured and they were victorious. In other words, they did not worship the image and they did not take the mark of the beast. But in the process of doing the, those two things, they were martyred, they were killed. So look back at Revelations 12, 11. It says, and they have defeated him. And who's him? The Antichrist, the beast. And how did they defeat him? By the blood of the lamb and by their witness, by their testimony. So what does it mean? They believed in Jesus Christ. And because they believed in the blood of Jesus Christ, they spoke that out and they refused to worship the image. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. In other words, they had a choice to either worship the image or you die. You either take the mark of the beast or you cannot buy and sell or you won't have a job. And they said, you know what? Because of what Jesus has done, I can't do that. And that was their testimony. And as a result of that, they died. You see, the saints in the tribulation will, will only be victorious if they refuse to worship the image and if they refuse to take the mark. But in doing that, they're going to be killed. So, it's only in their death that a person finds victory over the beast. Now, verse 3 tells us that these martyrs sang two songs for the throne of God. One was the song of Moses, and the other was the song of the Lamb. Now, the link between these two songs is interesting because most people want to, want to know why in the world did they sing the song of Moses, and what does it have to do with the song of the Lamb? Because, you see, we're New Testament creatures. We kind of forget the Old Testament. You know, that, that was uh, only symbolic of what was going to happen when Jesus Christ came. So when we go get to the book of Revelations, it's like we throw the whole, you know, entire Old Testament out the door. But we know better than that, right? Because we see how, how, how much the Old Testament's linked, right? So, but you need to understand that the majority of people that are martyred during the, uh, the tribulation, they're Jewish, they're Jews. So they came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, and they have a deep understanding of the Old Testament. So these martyrs, when they're standing before the throne of God, begin to sing the song of Moses, but they also sing the song of the Lamb. But these two songs are linked together. And what is the link? Well, think about this. The song of Moses celebrated the Israelites' deliverance from Egypt. So the song of Moses celebrated the Israelites' deliverance from Egypt. And if you want to see, uh, see the song of Moses, there's actually two. One is found in Exodus chapter 15. And the other one is found in Deuteronomy chapter 32. Now, the Song of Moses celebrated Israel's deliverance from Egypt. And if you remember the Exodus story, God delivered Israel from Egypt and he brought them into the promised land. But the way he did it is that he, he, he brought plagues upon the Egyptians. And when Pharaoh refused to give up, he destroyed Pharaoh along with his army. And we remember the final plague in which all the firstborn died and everyone, everyone in Egypt cried out. And as a result of them crying out, Pharaoh said, just go, get out of here. But when they realized that the Israelites were leaving with all their spoils, 
and they weren't going to have any, any more servants or slaves anymore. Pharaoh said, I can't allow this to happen. So he refused to give up, and so he chased after him. And what did God do? He destroyed Pharaoh along with his army. And that's exactly what happens in the tribulation. God brings plagues upon the beast and his followers, and when the beast refuses to give up, God destroys him along with his army. And then, guess what? We as the saints get to inherit the promised land. We come back to the earth along with the kingdom of God, and that's the link between these two songs. Does that make sense? All right. Verses 5, 6, and 7. All right, after this, I looked, and I saw in heaven the temple, that is, the tabernacle of the covenant law, and it was opened. And out of the temple came the seven angels with the seven plagues. They were dressed in clean, shining linen and wore golden sashes around their chests. Then one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls filled with the wrath of God, who lives forever and ever. Now, I want you to notice that these angels are dressed in shining linen robes, and they have golden sashes around their chests. Remember, I've said it many times, if there's details in the Bible, we need to pay attention to it. More than likely, it's there for a reason. So when it begins to describe their dress, I take notice of that. Now, why in the world does it tell us that they were dressed in shining linen robes and they had golden sashes around their chest? Because that type of dress had meaning. Linen was the fabric that the priest wore. Let me explain why. Linen is fabric of choice in warm weather because it's cool in the summer and it breathes, so it remains crisp and fresh, even in extreme uh, hot weather. If you ever travel over to Israel during the, the months of Ju uh, June, July, August, or September, it's extremely hot, and we here in Houston can identify with that, right? <laughs> hot and humid. <laughs> yeah, we know, we know a little bit about that. So, so the priests who had, had to do all this work for the Lord, they're busy working inside the temple, they would get extremely hot, so linen was the fabric of choice. Now, what's the interesting thing about linen is the more you wear it, the softer and more supple it becomes, and that's why the priests wore it. You see, the priests were not supposed to sweat. They were, uh, they were the priests. Uh, well, why were the priests not supposed to sweat? <laughs> because sweat represents work. And remember that one of the curses... Yeah, we don't want to sweat, do we? <laughs> so remember one of the curses that came upon Adam uh, that was that he would have to earn his bread by, uh, by the work of his brow or by the sweat of his brow, right? So sweat rep represents work or hard labor. Now, priests weren't supposed to sweat, and the reason that they weren't supposed to sweat is because sweat represents work. And it's not by works that we're justified, it's by the sacrifice of the lamb that we're justified. So as part of the symbolism of the sacrificial system, the priests weren't supposed to sweat. And that's why they wore linen. So the angels are dressed in linen. In other words, they're dressed like priests. And what does that tell us? That these angels minister in the presence of God. These aren't just any angels. These aren't the angels that normally come upon the earth. These aren't our guardian angels that are sent out by God. Their job is to minister in the temple in the presence of God. And notice, they're also wearing golden sashes around their chest. A golden sash symbolized royalty or an extremely elevated status. So a golden sash symbolized royalty or an extremely elevated status. So these aren't just any angels. They are emissaries of Jesus Christ. Now, does everybody know what an emissary is? An emissary is an agent who is sent on behalf of another. But emissaries hold a very high position in government. So if you ever meet someone and they say that they're an emissary, it means that they hold a very high position in whatever government that they're from. So immediately when we see these angels who come out in, in their linen, and this tells us that the, the normal positions have been before the presence of God, they minister in the temple that's in heaven. But not only that, that they're wearing golden sashes around their chest. This tells us that these angels are emissaries. They have a very high position. So these high-ranking angels are carrying out God's will. And this is something very special for them to do, coming outside of the temple to carry out God's will upon the earth. And as they come out of the temple, one of the four living creatures 
uh, hands, each one of them a golden bowl filled with the wrath of God. So the word filled indicates that they're filled to the brim with God's wrath. So this tells us that the final plagues are going to be devastating. The earth is going to feel the full wrath of God. In fact, when you read this in the original Greek text, it tells you that it is so filled to the brim that they have to be very careful that it doesn't pour out or spill, or spill over. But the whole thought behind that is that these are filled with the wrath of God, and when they're poured out upon the earth, the earth is going to feel the full wrath of God. Revelations 15, 8. Now, the, and the temple was filled with smoke from the, glo- from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now, I'll be honest with you because Revelation is a book of symbolism. Many times we'll read past this and think, okay, that's, that's, just, that's neat, but we don't really catch the symbolism of what it means. So I want to emphasize verse number eight. So I'm going to read it one more time. It says, in, in, in the temple, talking about the temple in heaven, was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no one could enter the temple until the seven plagues of the seven angels were completed. Now notice what this is saying. As soon as the seven angels leave the temple, the glory and power of God fills the temple like smoke, and no one is able to enter the temple in heaven until the seven plagues are completed. Now this is not a unique situation. In fact, this very thing has happened twice before. It happened in the days of Moses in Exodus chapter 40, verses 34 through 35. When Moses made their tabernacle in which God was going to dwell in the Ark of the Covenant and was going to be placed at the, in the Holy of Holies after, the, uh, after this had taken place, God's glory and power filled the tabernacle. It was like a cloud. Now, when you go back and you read it, we can see that it could either describe it as a cloud or it can describe it as smoke. But what I want you to notice is what it says. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. Verse uh, Exodus 40, 34 through 35. It says, Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. It also happened in the days of Solomon. If you remember when Solomon built the temple, David was not allowed to. In fact, David collected all the material that was necessary to build the temple, and he received the instructions of the Lord of how to build it. Even though it was different from the, uh, than the first tabernacle, it was still set up with the same basic structure, but it was a little, more, a little bit more elaborate. So when Solomon builds a temple, he then comes to dedicate it, and notice what happens. And this is going to be found in 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 10 through 11. And it came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of the Lord. So the priests could not stand in could not stand to minister because of the, cl- of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the house of the Lord. But I want you to notice that each time that this happened, the power and the glory of the Lord was so strong that no one could enter into the temple and no one could stand and minister before God. All they could do was fall down and worship God. So now what this symbolizes, and this is very important, is that no one or no thing can interrupt God's glory and power during this time. So no one or no thing can interrupt God's glory and power during this time. In other words, from the time that the seven angels begin pouring out the wrath of God until the return of Jesus Christ upon the earth, no one can interrupt God's plan. No one can go into the temple and interrupt what he's doing. And no one can stand before his glory and power and even attempt to stop the judgments that are getting ready to come. Now, I want you to understand how the, how the Jewish mind would perceive this and see this. They, when they see that from the time that, that, that these angels go out with the seven bowls of God's wrath, and it says as smoke fills the temple, and no one can enter the temple until those seven plagues are completed, they would understand that you don't interrupt God. You can't interrupt them. What God has decided to do is going to take place, and no one can interrupt his plans. It's going to happen. So from the time that the seven angels step out of the temple until Jesus Christ returns, God is not deterred. He is not impeded. Nothing is interrupted. His will is going to be done, 
And that is what chapter 15 is all about. Now, next week, we're going to get to see these seven plagues, and we're going to study chapter 16, and then we're going to receive the results of these plagues, or see the results of these plagues, when, uh, which is chapter 17, 18, and 19. And then chapter 17 and 18, uh, what we're going to see is the fall of Babylon. We're going to see actually what happens as a result of these seven plagues. Then in chapter 19, we're going to see the return of Jesus Christ. But it was these seven plagues that bring about the ultimate goal of God, which is the return of Jesus Christ. See, I told you it's going to be a short lesson today. <laughs> Eight verses. <laughs> so uh, anybody have any questions or did y'all miss any of the, the fill in the blanks? Oh, uh, so... In the millennium, they're going to still have evil people around, I'm gathering, right? Well, uh, what's going to be interesting is uh, because some people are still going to be alive, that will, that will mean that they will still have the endemic nature. Okay, so, so that's why so many people will be turned towards Satan when he escapes. I mean, not could, escapes, but when he's let loose. Right, yeah, there's going to be a remnant there that could yeah. that still be prone to that. Yeah. Okay, because, uh, okay. I thought the millennium was going to be all nice and everything, but because they're going to be able to refuse to, to go to the temple when they're required to go. That's what I'm... If, if they don't like so rain, they can do they're that. Gonna be evil. Okay. <laughs> they're going to they're gonna have to suffer a drought, but yeah, they can, they can refuse to go to the temple. Somewhere back there, you said a word. It was a plague of leaves, lease. We couldn't make it out. Do you remember what that was? I do not. It sounded that way, but I don't know what it really was. Um, I didn't say anything about leaves. or. or uh, well, it was a plague of, and then it sounded like lease or leaves. Oh. No, I don't. I'd have to look it up and try to see what you're uh, It was earlier to. in the thing somewhere, but I don't know where either. Okay. I'll have to get back with you and see if I can find what you're uh, referring to. Okay. What would happen if the priests actually did sweat? Um, I, they'd probably I'm have to go through, curious. They'd probably have to go through some type of ceremonial cleansing process. <laughs> that's that's going to be real cute. Yeah. <laughs> that's why they invented baby powder. So. <laughs> I tell you, I'd have a hard time being a priest. <laughs> right. That would be tough. It don't take much. Yeah. You know. Uh, anybody else have anything, any comments, questions? All right. Is someone else ready? <laughs> yeah. No, no. I, I, remember you, oh, I remember you said that uh, the warm part, the hot part of the year in Israel is what, like, like us, uh, uh, June, July, August, and September. Right. And so uh, it just kind of, to me, solidifies that you, I think I don't know if you remember when you were uh, teaching uh, the Gospels, mm -hmm. and you said Jesus was born in September. Right. I just you know, and that's why it was warm. You know, it wasn't any snow or anything around right. then. I, I just kind of thought about that. You know, just interesting to me. Yeah, that <laughs> so. that timing is interesting, isn't it? The, yep. And it happened to be like right around September 11th. <laughs> yeah. All right, anybody else? All right, well, we'll just go ahead and close in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for your word, Lord. And we just ask that you'll just continue to speak to us as we, as we continue to press forward and, 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 and press into your word and learn, learn more about what you're saying in your word, Lord. We thank you for the guidance that you're giving us, Lord. We thank you for the understanding that you're allowing us to have, Lord. We just ask that you'll just continue to anoint us in our, in our studies uh, to, as we seek after you, Father, and as we uh, fellowship with one another. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Y'all have a blessed day, and we'll see you at 1030.